Hi, and thanks for checking in. I'm Anthony Mason, and we're here in the CBS This Morning Toyota Green Room with author Mitch Album. His best-selling book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, has touched readers' lives for 15 years. It tells the story of Eddie, a maintenance worker in an amusement park, who dies after a saving a girl named Annie. Album's new novel, The Next Person You Meet in Heaven, is a sequel to that popular story. It follows Annie as an adult and introduces us to the five people she meets in heaven. Mitch Album, good to see you. Hi, how are you? Thanks for being here. Thank you. I, I know you've you've talked about this a little bit already out on, on tour, uh, that, that people were asking you for years to write a sequel for this book. Yeah. Of what? all the books that I've written, this is probably the one I've heard the most about. As you mentioned, you know, Eddie dies goes to heaven, meets five people, but it is described in that book as the first stage of heaven. Right. So, of course, yeah, everybody wants that, to know that. So what's the second stage <laughs> of heaven? Right. And so, you know, uh, that combined with uh, people asking what happened to Annie, did she grow up? And I always thought that that would be interesting. What happens if you grow up knowing that your life is only going on because somebody else's is gone? Yeah. So... It seemed after 15 years, and I'd had heaven on my mind anyhow for, uh, you know, I've seen losses in my life in the last few years. I mm -hmm. thought, well, this was a good time to do it. Did you have, when you wrote the, when you wrote the first book, did you have answers to those questions? No, really, that's an interesting question. When I wrote the first book, first of all, I was 15 years younger. And um, what I was really trying to do with the first book was write a book that showed people who, like my uncle, thought they were nobodies. Mm -hmm actually were wrong, yeah. that everybody is somebody. Everybody, everybody touches, touches somebody's somebody. life. You have no yeah. idea. And so Eddie is the quintessential nobody. He thinks he, you know, he's wasted his whole life. He's working, fixing rides in an amusement park. What kind of job is that for a grown yeah. man? Yeah. When he gets to heaven, he finds out that, you know, towards the end, that when he was in the war, he killed a little girl accidentally. He burned a hut and she was inside of it. And so this life of being at an amusement park mm -hmm keeping rides safe for children was actually a form of penance for what he had done to this. So, so there was a balance to it all. Yeah. So um, this book, Annie, doesn't remember the accident. She blacks it all out. It's all one of those traumatic things. She only remembers mm -hmm. going in the morning and then coming home and something, everything was different. Right. And she is haunted by the idea that everything she does is a mistake not understanding that, well, of course, that was like the biggest mistake. She ran the wrong direction. He yes. had to save her. He dies as a result. Right. So the point of this book is similarly to the first one. No, there's not, life is not a mistake. The things that you do are not mistakes. We just don't realize, perhaps, what they're going to lead to right. or what right they can allow us to do by doing wrong the first time around. And that mm -hmm. was kind of the overall message of this. How full a picture did you have of Annie going into this book? Less than... Eddie, because Eddie was based on a real person. person yeah. Eddie was my uncle Eddie, uh, who was 83, grizzled war vet. He actually mm -hmm. had a near-death experience, which inspired this whole kind of concept. When uh, he was in open-heart surgery, he said that he died, and they said that he died, and he came out of his body and kind of rose up above the table and was looking down, and then he said mm -hmm. he saw all his dead relatives yeah. waiting for him at the edge. Of course, we were asking him, what'd you do, Uncle Ed? You know, and he was a salty old guy. He said, do, I told him, get the hell out of here. I'm not ready for anything. <laughs> and, uh, and then he went back into his body. I think he scared them back into heaven. And, uh, you know, he lived a little while longer. But to me, yeah. that was always the idea of what happens when you go to heaven. Because yeah. he was, I mean, you trust your relatives, right? I mean, there are lots of books out there about yeah. the white light and all that. But when your uncle tells, tells you, you, yeah, you believe it. Your so I always, been there. Yeah, he's been there briefly, but been there. And so I thought, okay, this is really what happens. But what if they're not all your relatives? What if they're just people who some may be your relatives, as in this book, and yeah. sees her mother again. Yeah. But some may just be passerby people that you, you know, spent five minutes with and you changed their life and they changed yours right. forever. And I really believe that we have that effect on one another. It, you have, I mean, you've had six number one, consecutive number one bestsellers going back to Tuesdays with Maury. You have, you have a lot of fans who, who come maybe with some expectations. And I'm wondering when you sit down to write a book like this, if you feel that in any way. Sure. I, I'm going to imagine that every author does in some regard. Um, in a small way, uh, for example, Tuesdays with Maury never had a curse word in it. No. And uh, when I went to write my next book, by the time I got to write it... Uh, Tuesdays with Maury had, very accidentally, because it was supposed to be a tiny little book, right. had become this really widely read book. And I remember I put some curse words in the novel that I was writing, and I got back, no, no, you, you can't do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I never have since. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's no <laughs> sex scenes, there's no curse words. Yeah, you know, there's certain expectations from your audience. Yeah. But really, 
It's not a, I'm not pigeonholed because I am writing what I am interested in and it yeah. just so happens that that's what they're interested in. I don't think people would come to me for a science fiction novel about outer space, but I'm not really interested in writing a yeah. science fiction novel about outer space. I'm interested in life and, and its different meanings and, and the, the, the observations we have about it. And I just try to find interesting ways to tell the story. You, you alluded to this earlier, but in the end, you wrote this book in part to process some of your own personal grief. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, I lost my mother, my father, and a little girl that we were raising as our daughter. Uh, I have an orphanage in Haiti that I operate in. She was one of our 47 kids. She developed a brain tumor, mm -hmm. uh, came up to live with us as we traveled the world trying to keep her alive. You dedicate the book to her. I do, uh, because I think children really teach you. Uh, mm -hmm. They teach you, I think the most significant thing they teach you is that life is a lot better when you're living it for someone else mm -hmm. than just for yourself. And that's what I think the concept of family really is based on. And for two years, my wife and I, who did not have children of our own, even though we got 47 kids in Haiti, right. uh, really had that family thing with her. And, um, you know, I thought so much about loss, and it's so easy to get lost in the agony of loss. Yes. So there's a moment in the book which is directly related to Chica, our little girl's passing. Uh, one of the characters, I won't say who, uh, does this thing with pipe cleaners to Annie, uh, because pipe cleaners play a role in the book. And he takes, there are five pipe cleaners. He takes one and he makes a little heart. It's perfect, it's small. And he says, you see this? This is the heart we're born with. Mm -hmm. And then he takes the other four and he makes this big heart with lines across it and everything like that, but it's big. He says, you see this? This is the heart we die with. And she says, but it's all lined, it's all broken. He says, that's right, many times. And she says, so that's what ruins it. And he says, no, that's what makes it whole. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I have had to come to learn to live with loss. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, everybody does that. We have to recognize that, yes, we get these scars on our heart, but that's also what makes living rich and makes us appreciate the people we still have and the things we still have to do. If you didn't have the threat of ever losing anything, mm -hmm. you wouldn't know how precious it was. Mm -hmm. Did the book prove, the writing it prove therapeutic in that way? It did. It did. Um, I'm actually, yeah, I'm actually working on a book now about Chica, which is also very mm -hmm. therapeutic. And the philosophy that I have is uh, we didn't lose a child, we were given one. Mm -hmm. And throughout the next person you meet in heaven, that's kind of the idea too, that you keep thinking you make mistakes, Annie, yeah. but you were given an opportunity, you were given a chance, to, she was saved, for example, by Eddie, she becomes a nurse, yeah. why? Why did she become a nurse? Opportunity to save other people, make up for the life that you were trained. Right. We, we never even realized what might be at work, you know, moving us around on the board. I wanna ask you one last thing, because you wrote a lovely column last week about, about, about someone who gave you a, a lot of support, who, who probably didn't even realize it. Yeah. Dave Anderson, the yeah. New York Times columnist, who yeah. we lost. Yeah. And, and you point out in that column, he probably doesn't even know what he did for me. Exactly. He I, changed my life. I'm basically. so glad you brought that up because it's exactly the case. I was a starving musician here in New York. Yeah. I was looking for money. I was working as a freelance writer for a weekly shopper magazine. It just yeah. had TV listings, but, but the editor liked to have like a, a celebrity on the cover. So once a week, they would profile a celebrity. I got assigned for $50, Dave Anderson, the yeah. fine columnist for the New York Times. He actually met me for lunch. I mean, I don't know why he even answered the phone, <laughs> yes. but he met me for lunch in a New York, uh, 57th Street and Broadway. Yeah. He was there before me. I bumbled through all these questions about sports writing. At one point he said, I think you're making more of this job than it actually Please. is like that. Love that. Uh, but I was so impressed with him. <laughs> and, so I, and I ended up leaving. I remember going down to the subway and thinking, I wouldn't mind being like him. Yeah. That's kind of a cool job. And eventually I became a sports writer. Yeah. Years later ran into him and, and he looked at me and said, mm, you're here. And, and he said, I guess I couldn't talk you out of it. huh? Yeah. Now he, did ha he had no idea that that lunch was gonna do that. And yeah. I had no idea, but look at how that one little bump changed my life all that way. And yeah. you know, in, in that conceit, uh, Dave will be one of the people I meet in heaven because yeah. he changed my life. Yeah. So I think we all do that to one another. When we recognize that every day might give us that opportunity, maybe we won't be so hard on ourselves about how we're not, my life is meaningless. And right. that's what I hope people get out of this book. All right. The book is The Next Person You Meet in Heaven. Mitch Alden, thanks very much for oh, being with pleasure. us here in the Toyota Green Room. I enjoyed it.